Okay, thanks John, uh, uh, thanks for everyone for welcome, and thanks Tony for doing all that technical stuff. That, that makes my going forward a lot easier. Um, I, do, I do enjoy the technical side, but um, today I'm doing a presentation that um, I don't think I've done one without any agronomy. So this is my first one, my virgin um, course without agronomy. Um, John's outlined briefly the Sundown operation. Um, the, the key thing with our operation is it's an integrated business. Um, the cattle site's integrated right through the processing. And uh, furthermore, we're, we're marketing uh, direct beef um, into certain markets, and we're exploring that. Um, we have a, it's a bit of a, uh, a um, diverse sort of operation. We have cotton at one end and cropping at one end and, and cattle at the other. Obviously the cotton harvest has been on for the last, we well, into day 10. Yields are extraordinary. Um, insect pressure was low. Prices are not through the roof, but they're very good. So from a competitive business, I'm under a lot of pressure. Because that's how, that's how our business operates. Is, is based on profit. A lot of people come to our operations don't understand that we do operate on profit. And that's how, it's, that's how we go forward. Um, so we've, we've, taken on some, we've taken on some pretty large um, commitments and also vision, vision led by myself and the owners of, of what we're doing with cattle operations. And you've seen us in the cattle operations probably since the 80s. We've been through lots of different things. Um, but we're, I believe we're on a pretty good, straight and narrow job at the moment. We have other interests. Um, we own cotton gins, hardwood plantations and some plains and things like that. So uh, we do have a little bit further diversity. Um, basically, it's a pretty simple model. Our cattle model, it has to be simple to work. Um, obviously, 100% of our cattle are purchased. We don't breed any more. We were a... Uh, 15,000 cow operation with uh, about 25,000 value add. Um, we no longer do that, we're 100% cattle purchases. We've taken that option for a lot of reasons, which I haven't got time to explain now, but I'm sure you'll be getting the gist of where it's coming from. Um, our, our model's changing, and we will continue to change as we, as we um, I guess, sway the, the trial. Um, and all the purchases have currently come to Sundown Valley, um, which is about 65,000 on an annual basis. And they get, I'll go through all the treatments and things that happens to the backgrounding phase. We do, um, about 50% of our cattle go through to Gunnee now, and 50% go to other feedlots. So we're very exposed to the industry, and it's, we're not a little insular um, company that's um, fully value adding, I'd love to think we, we are, and we will get to that point, but we do service the market in, in, in the wider part of the world. Pretty Again, it's a pretty simple uh, production model. In weights are 280 kilos, out weights are 420. That's the basic principle. Um, Tony's alluded in his slides that we're operating in the really good area, the nice, healthy area. So I'll explain to you what happens in that area. Um, we do very good things with pasture. We can um, average daily gains of up to, or we're averaging about 1, 1 to 1.2 kilos on a 365 day period. Um, we have a weight gain of 140 kilos a turn, two turns, stocking rates about 15 to 20 DC, and we're producing about 500 to 700 kilos per hectare. Gunny feedlot, um, we've, we've had for, um, we've got to do only about 12, 18 months. Yeah. But basically, we've uh, changed Gunnay Feedlot entirely to a, to a completely 100% sundown cattle, auto induction, which I'll go through. Basically, trade, um, ox cattle, and we have other markets as well. What, who are we supplying? Uh, JBS are one, of, uh, are one of JBS's major supply to their feedlots, uh, to Beef City and Karuna. Um, we supply consistent quality and, and quantity of beef 
um, to both uh, Beef City and Karuna. Um, obviously our Kuro programs, as Tony's in, in, involved with, is reducing cattle sickness and increasing cattle performance in all the feedlots. That's not just JBS, that's across all the feedlots. Domestically, we're out of uh, Gunny, we've, we're supplying a 20 kilo of Woolworths kill at Tamworth. Um, all cattle are MSA graded. Um, I've put, I'm putting a little plug here relying on minimal stress factors. Um, we do direct, direct um, um, to processing, obviously JBS, AP, John D. We have quite a, a lot of markets in the 100 day as, as everyone else does. What we're doing a little bit different, um, <coughs> with the marketing uh, program going with the direct marketing of beef, cotton and grain to overseas and domestic markets. We have a, obviously we've been direct marketing cotton for about 15 years to Indonesia, China and Korea. And funnily enough, they all seem to go together a little bit. So that's helping us with our um, understanding and leading people and understanding the markets. Um, vertically integrated beef operation, we're paying ownership to processing. Um, we're looking at a little further, further with that. Um, and we've been, I guess this is, this is how we view ourselves, but it's also how um, both domestic and, and export people are viewing our operation. We're a unique beef operation in Australia, offering industry best practice from paddock to plate, and it's a unique story from both export and domestic consumers. We, um, we, we try and utilise the leading professionals. We're lucky enough to have one in the room here with us today. Um, yesterday we had a meeting with involved um, <coughs> fellas, except Tony couldn't be there, he just was a bit jet lagged, so he couldn't get there. But we're, we're starting to, to put together some integration within, for the industry as well as our, our company, and I think we're starting to make some good traction. Um, so we have um, obviously veterinarians, nutritionists, agronomists, and, and we're involved actively in research projects. So we'll get to the, get to the crux of it. Um, I'm sure you all know that I'm pretty out on yard wing. Why? Why, why do we yard wing? Number one, it's the sustainability of the industry. Tony's already outlined that we've got an increase in VRD. It's um, whether it's uh, over time, that's, that's happening. So I believe the sustainability of the industry, maybe, what was it, 6,696? 6, all the cattle will be dead. I know that might be our issue, but let's let's look at sustainability in the shorter period, and let's reduce that 0.2%. Um, that's what I'm that's where I'm coming from, and as as a, as a breed society and as a general cattle industry, we've got to take hold of it. Um, increased market opportunities and acceptance. Tony's outlined a couple of the acceptance points, as well as the warm and fuzzies. You saw you saw the big picture there. We're under we're under a spotlight, and I can tell you it won't. It won't be sustainable to be selling calves through the yard on the land. There's no one in the world. Re reputation of cattle performance for marketing future. If your cattle are, are reputable, they're performers, they're healthy, you'll have repeat you'll have repeat buyers. If they're not, you'll have buyers, but they won't be repeat. We're looking at higher survival rates. Tony's already outlined some of that, I'll outline a bit more. Both in the, in the transport background and feedlot stage. We've always very been very focused on this, this point here with survival rates. Since we've been operating in our operation three years of basically purchasing cattle, um, this background in survival rate has come out um, surprisingly and a bit alarming in a lot of the situations and I'll explain that a bit further. Better temperament of, in, in paddocks and pens, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of that, you're all cattle and and I think you all understand the importance of the right temperament. And obviously the warm and fuzzy is the perceptional market, which Tony alluded to. We are under pressure, we'll we continue to be under pressure. If we don't take hold of it, our industry will be very difficult to manage. <coughs> when you when you yard wean, there's a few um, things to be looked at. Um, Tony's already mentioned about acclimation. Acclimation is, is handling of the cattle, understanding the cattle, and, and getting them used to what we're about. And that comes down to a few things. The attitude of the stock person, the behaviour of the stock person, the fear of, 
animals by humans. Um, Tony's already touched on. They're a predatory animal. They're, they're frightened of, of humans and they've got to understand them. And productivity, health and welfare. Acute and chronic stress response. We're talking predominantly about stress related issues. We all know ourselves as humans what happens under stress. We don't function too well. Um, we don't function too well um, when we're feeling sick, all those sorts of things. Have a little jack in the same. And the ability to cope declines as stress increases. So you, you st whatever stress it is, um, I've got some points here of stress. I've, I've estimated unyard between cattle on arrival to us at Nostra 12, 12 different stresses. So production of stress, obviously stress, and then you get production of stress hormones, and then you get immunosuppression, which uh, Tony's alluded to, which is the uh, ability or the inability of the animals to uh, um, um, fight, fight disease or BRD or whatever it may be, reduce the disease defence, and ultimately you get disease. And, and Tony's done a wonderful job in showing you all the disease factors, what it looks like. Uh, thank goodness I don't have to go and put all those slides up because they're not very nice slides. Stress, stress of unweaned cattle, as I said, there's at least 12 stresses put on unweaned calves going from farm to sale yard to, or to a new farm or feedlot. The sort of stresses we're talking about is the separation, the handling of cattle in yards, the transport of cattle, the moving into the sale yards, the boxing of cattle and, or drafting of cattle in the sale yards, the sale yard process, the, the auction process of hundreds of people around there, the noise, then you've got on top of that, then they're sold and they're back to the yards again, then they're, then they're held in a, in, in a delivery pen for maybe 20, 12 hours, up to 12 hours, then they're trucked again, then they're trucked to us, go through the same process, so it's a pretty awful bloody life for unwind cattle. And surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, they die because it's overstressed. This is a comment, the, the way I talk to a couple of people, of how to describe unwind cattle. Relentless compounding of stress, and it's enough to cripple a, a fragile developing immune system. That's what's happening. How do yard wean? We'll move on to that. This is the objectives. Acclimation and handling, it's a, it's a major, major role in what we're trying to achieve. Increased immunity of, to respiratory diseases. You're trying to socialise the cattle. You're educate and experience confinement and outside stresses or, or different stresses, and obviously we're looking at temperament. What do we have to do to yard wean? I get this question every single day, and I get um, probed on it. I, which I, talk, I was talking last night to our um, head induction receival person. I said, how would you yard wean outside the sundown system? He said, it's very simple. You have a yard, a cut yard, and you have a a larger yard. You don't need huge infrastructure. If you haven't got cattle yards, okay, you're in trust off. But if you've got cattle yards, you can win. There's no reason you can't win. What you've got to ensure that you've got to have an escape proof yard to start with, which if you haven't got that in cattle yards, you're in strife. Because you can't load cattle out. They don't understand how you get cattle to the side yard if you don't have an escape proof yard. You need to confine the cattle initially for the first three days. I'll actually go through the piece by piece. I'm the stock against about four, four metres squared per head for 250 to 260 kilo wieners. Provide water trough space equivalent to two centimetres per head. Make sure the water is clean and accessible. Provide feed bunk or feeder space minimum 15 centimetres per head. Yard should be clean so there's, no, there's not an excess of dust. Dusty and sprinkled water, a little water to settle it down. Obviously, in the other case, in extreme muddy condition, apply wood chips over, over the yard or similar bedding, or opt not to wean them during wet periods. There's, there is options out there. Unfortunately, we don't get that option. We do now. We did it 12 months ago. We had to take cattle when we got cattle because we were buying unweaned cattle 
And part of our protocol is we supply 100% yard wing cover. So we didn't have an option, we do now. Feeding and water requirements, provide good quality grassy loose and hay. In a hay feeder, ad lib. I know everyone doesn't have hay feeders. We do do some ground feeding. It's preferable not to do it that way, but it is acceptable in certain situations. So the estimated minimum requires about 1.5% of body weight. Hay treated with generated label rates. That's a product we've been using to success. There are other um, electrolytes you can use. We prefer to use hay treated with generated rather than in a water situation because water we believe is the critical thing to have a clean and no nothing in it. You start putting electrolytes and things in and you do get a uh, lack of intake of water. Um, whereas your hay, you generally particularly loosen it. Hay it doesn't have to be prime loosen, good grassy loosen's fine. It, it takes, uh, they take a lot better. Providing feed and uh, provide feed in the feed bunk or feeder. This can be loosened hay silage or commercial pellets, whichever, whatever suits your, or tickles your fancy, what you've got available. We use basically loosened hay because we, we grow 6,000 acres of loosened, so it's easy. Uh, we, we use silage and we have used commercial pellets. So depending on what you're doing and how you want to do it. Don't be confined by these sort of things. Use a step up program starting 0.5, and then increase day by day. The critical thing, water clean trough daily. Monitor your water intakes. If they're not drinking, they're dehydrating and you lose weight, it's very simple. The same as if they're not eating, they lose weight and end up dying, so it's, it's very simple. So the weaning process that we put together is, is, a, is a basic thing I've been working on for probably with. Been in the yard weaning for about eight years. Might be longer, I reckon we've I've estimated we've yard weaned about 120, 130,000 um, cattle. And I've had to make a very simple process for, for the, my managers and the people <coughs> in the yards, because it doesn't have to be complex in that. And for it to work, you have a simple. Day one, calves are received from cows and placed in the preparation yard. Handler works with calves quietly to slow down panic. Motion images, calves to butt. Hay feeder and water trough. This handling session is about 15 to 20 minutes, maybe 20 minutes maximum. Provide treated hay with generate at mobile rates. Day two, handling proceeds the same as day one, but with two handling sessions morning and, morning and evening. Provide fresh hay and clean water. Day three, handling session, if these cattle is responding to the handler, they can, they can be turned out to a larger yard and work in a similar fashion. The education includes moving cattle back into the small yard. This is a small shift in 15 to 20 minutes, twice a day, and calves end up in the small yard at the end of the day. Check manure and room and fill. Provide hay treated and fresh water. So, so far, we've had uh, 20 minutes here, 40 minutes here, and 40 minutes here. Day four, same as day three. Very simple. Day five, handling session, cattle turned into weaner paddocks using the same procedure. Handler works the calves to control panic motions as, as before. Once calves settle down, they can be left in the yard, left, they can be left in the large yard, sorry. Cattle return to the yards in the evening. Again, check manure and fill. As you can see, we, we're doing a small sessions of handling and we're getting them exposed to a bigger and bigger yard as time goes on. Day six, same as day five, check uh, the uh, manure and room and fill. Day seven, same as day six. It's pretty simple. Um, but at this point, if, if the feces are consistent, calves are full, they, um, and they're, they're handling well, they're not, they're not running, they're not spooking, they're right to go. Basically, they're ready to go. That's as simple as that. If we look at a, um, if we look at a, um, a abrupt weaning or a, a, an unweaned animal, in my experience and in what what we see in, in the, across Eastern Australia, what happens to a lot of the unweaned cattle? They're generally taken off the cow the day before the sale. Sometimes to Queensland, further go, the more 
further north you go, the longer they're off for the cow. So I've seen an, ex um, an example around this local area, or in New England, that they've actually had them in three days prior to the Rowena sale. Not doing anything with them, but they've been off the cow for three days, then they go to the Rowena sale. Then it all starts. So I don't understand why there isn't some inter inter interjection there of doing something with them in those first 24, 48 hours. Because as you'll see, it's, it's a pretty major effect by yard wind, what, what it has to the, the animal's immune system and performance. Basically I've done um, weaning, stronger immune system, increased risk of BRD with unwind, ability to travel. For, from our experience, we, we, we're bringing cattle from Narrow Court, it's up, up as far as um, probably in the middle of Queensland there. It's about um, anywhere from about 16 to 1800 kilometres. If we have unweaned cattle, they don't have the ability to travel because they die. Because the stress of, of travel, they just fall. And you'll, you'll lose it probably up to 5%. But once they are weaned, you actually have the ability to travel. We have, on, on the way through, we have rehydration centres and to break the, break the trip up and all sorts of things. So we've, we've put things in all the way along. Obviously the temperament, we can control the temperament to get the temperament in, in, in the correct um, attributes for what we're looking for. Obviously unweaned cattle, some have good temperaments, but some of it's very variable. Some of them are uh, just un, uncontrollable. Obviously there's less mortality, as Tony's already alluded to, higher mortality unweaned, less morbidity, higher morbidity. High performance on, on grass and feedlot, wean cattle, lower performance on grass and feedlot. That's fact. I was talking to Tony as I came in, and I actually was going through a, a bit of a lip search over the weekend, filling, filling in a bit of time with a bit bored, um, and, and dug up some uh, info and, and research that they've been doing in Oklahoma, because we haven't got a lot of this information in Australia, other than, I guess, what we've been doing, and there is a little bit. Oklahoma have done a really good set of um, trials comparing yard weaned, fence weaned, unweaned, and their progression right through the whole chain. And the weaned cattle perform all the way through uh, above um, unweaned, which doesn't surprise me, that's, a, that's exactly what our experience is. And performance is both weight gain and specifications, as well as um, obviously death and, and morbidity. So a trial that's been in Australia since when was this done? Uh, uh, early 90s. Early 90s, it? yeah. It's been, it's been around for a long time. I've, I've showed, it's my most popular slide I've shown. Because it's a very simple one. While you don't worry about the actual numbers, the, the, there is a significant difference in that. The effective weaning method on feedlot performance, um, paddock weaned, which are basically just let out in the paddock and feed them themselves. Um, in, in, what, this is, uh, this would have been, I presume, about 100 days after. I don't know exactly the, yeah, it would be a background phase and then into the, into the feedlot. Paddock weaned, um, average day of the game, um, 1.08. Uh, yard train, which is similar to um, fence line, where they are coming to the yards a bit and they are handled a little bit, but that's not the full job. 1.2, yard wind, which is what I've gone through, except in that, at that period of time they wouldn't have had the acclimation in there, I wouldn't imagine. Acclimation has sort of become a, a major part of the, the weaning process now. Um, and they, 1.285, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Then we move into what Tony's area of, of health. What, what this is about is the sickness, the animals that were report, which um, Tony alluded to, they were pulled out of the, out of the feed yard because they were sick with their pen riders. <coughs> Big difference here is paddock wean cattle, 18% of the cattle were pulled out of the feedlot. The yard train, there was six, I think it was nearly 7% pulled, and in the yard wean there was about 3%. Huge variation that exactly what Haynes showed you the facts and figures on, on, on the effect of that. So that's the that's the weaning, <coughs> weaning part. 
Um, to me, that is number one. Number one in the whole of whatever we do, that is the number one thing that we can do to best set our cattle up for an integrated program. It's obviously the best thing you can do for, for uh, if you're selling to feedlots, if you're retaining ownership, I don't, I don't care what you're doing with the cattle, but that is your, your single most, uh, the simplest, probably the cheapest thing that you can possibly do on your farm to change the dynamics of your cattle, without exception. So when we go the next step, we do a little bit different. We go, we move on, we're, because we're integrated with feedlots, and we're also selling to feedlots, which, which Tony has the, um, the beauty of looking after the sick animals in, in those feedlots, and I'm sure he's seen a lot less of our cattle sick. So in our feedlot health and performance, how, we, how I've just come up with eight points, yard weaning I've already covered, vaccination programs, internal external parasites, co-mingling, weight ranging, acclimation, nutrition, and feedlot induction. So vaccination programs, it's a pretty simple in the background <coughs> operation. It's either five, seven, or eight in one at induction, and then a boost of four to six weeks later of, of the same product. Whichever vaccination program you want to do is your choice, in, in, in my view, from a background point of view. We opt to use 18 one because that's what we've opted to do. We've, we've found in our system, particularly in our leasing systems, that it performs better. But that's, that's our personal opinion. Um, you, you, as long as they're vaccinated with one of the clostridials, I'm, I'm pretty happy. As far as BRD, again, there's a little bit of variation uh, Tony alluded to. Bovilus MH or Bovilus MH IBR. We, we opt to, with, a, with a booster. Same as the vaccination. This is these products are determined a little bit by where you're sending your cattle to. We opt for this one because we we have a proper auto induction. Our cattle don't get inducted when they go to the feedlot, so we don't want to be using the the um, and We found this this working pretty well for us. Whereas some feedlots still still have the preference for Bovilus uh, MH because they're using Rhinogard on entry. So you, you need to understand that before you start that program. But go any further back, we'll do that. Um, so that's a program we we predominantly this the uh, MHIBR program. Internal external parasites, induction backgrounding when they come in when they first come to us, we generally use an ML and a flucoside, unless we have some history of those cattle, uh, which we don't get much of, we don't get much history. Generally. Um, ongoing backgrounding, we determine by fecal egg counts and cultures. Um, it's very interesting when you're trying to run a, a program like we do with 40,000 cattle, trying to determine what branch to use. That's, that's one of my most commonly asked questions. What branches do you use? It doesn't matter what, what differences it make. You've got to understand what you've got, not, not, not what we've got. So you and we've We've done a lot of fecal egg count and, um, and culture was exactly the same as the sheep industry. Yes, it's we're all told it's not very accurate, but I can assure you that our, our internal parasite um, program is 10 times better than it was 18 months ago. We're now getting a situation where we're getting clean paddocks. We, we have a clean out program to go into oats and loose and so we have zero egg count on all those cattle now, and there's zero egg count going into the into the uh, feedlot, as well as we've got a fluke program for monitoring. Feedlot entry, again, it's determined by fecal egg count and, and culture. We don't, we don't try and second guess things. Um, you saw Tony's slide with all the different options he's got in his world. We've got a little few little things we can use, and I, and I believe they're, they're very good. Any external parasites treated as required, so whatever, whatever problem, ticks, lice, whatever, whatever you've got to treat as as required. Co-mingling and, and weight ranging. Um, Tony alluded to this, is that's the socialisation of those cattle. He's talked about what we should have record, 80, 80 vendors in one pen. I think we'd have 20s in some of ours. But what we're doing, we're doing that at a farm level, not at feedlot level. But we have the same problem. If you don't, if you don't co-mingle cattle, you put them into the feedlot, you'll have 
you'll exaggerate that problem in the feedlot and because of the intensity and your, your feeding ratio. So we're doing a lot of this on, on, on back on the farm. We like a minimum of 40 days. We really like to go down to 60 or 80 days if we can do it. Um, we weight range at, at both at backgrounding phase and at feedlot phase because you understand why your weight range is because of the competitiveness for the feeding, um, both on grass and feedlots the same. The, you, you still get the bullies, you still get you still get issues in, in the backgrounding operation. Um, and that's why I write and write up on, on two kilos ADG. A lot of these things attribute to performance both on grass and feedlot. Acclimation. Does everyone know what acclimation is? Yeah, it's not it's not that. Yeah, it, 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 you're getting involved with the you're getting involved with the animals and trying to understand Tony Tony had his movie, that's what you were doing initially. You're acclimating them, you were is it a word such as deacclimating? Unacclimating, that's probably one of the ones. Yeah, when you nearly fell off the horse up with unacclimating. So what we're trying to do is expose to all the stresses, humans, dogs, motor vehicles, bikes, horses, trucks, um, understanding what we're doing with the cattle. And this is, this is all stress related. Like in, in my early days, in, whenever I started in 2006, no horses, we were all in, no horses on the farm, zero. Um, plenty of motorbikes going at a million miles an hour um, with people on them that shouldn't have been on them. Um, out of control dogs and lots of them. And Basically, that was the situation. Now, what we do, as, as um, Kev Sullivan and, and Haney uh, would attribute to, when cattle come on, you actually greet them. You welcome them. They, they come off the truck, and the first thing they see is, is a person. And so, hell, and, and not a person going berserk, a person leading them to come through. That's the first experience they have on that, in that area of someone accepting. Human. Then they go through a series series of things over time in our, in our period is about our acclimation period on our induction is about 48 hours approximately but then they get a there's acclimation going on from then on from today 100 or 120 when they leave the farm so when they go to the feedlot. So it's a big part of it it's a, it's a stress stress or, or minimising stress um, it's really Quickly, you can um, unacclimate. I think we're going to use that word now. It's very easy to unacclimate cattle at that stage. What happens when what happens when trucks pull up? At your farms. You need to get a bloody jigger. <laughs> Correct. What do you do with the jigger? Because <laughs> yeah. that's that's exactly what happens. Our, our fellows that turn up know not just because they know what will happen with the jigger. They, they, they hop out of the trucks and they're, they're trained as well, so they understand what we're trying to do. It was an interesting training process. I've never seen so many frustrated truck drivers in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but they all got over it. They're all over it. They understand it now. There's no problem. We have, I don't know how many trucks coming in, probably 50, up to 15, 20 a day. We have trucks coming in and we're loading out the trucks. And there's no arguments about it. When we first started, I remember Kev Sullivan's first visit. They just put, they just shake their head. They were shaking their head. They said, "You blokes, how many cattle are you going to do? 60, 60 or 80 thousand? Well, you're not going to get them out. There. You're going to be all day trying to get the cattle loaded. After the, the first week, like we can, uh, we unloaded trucks coming from um, uh, Headingley. They were unloading." One minute fifty nine seconds, the V doubles, and we load we load in about about fifteen minutes. Very it's no different than what you're doing. We we've got capacity to unload and load, and we have to because we've got to move cut all the time. But we do it properly. You don't just go Yahoo and start throwing your arms around, jigger everywhere. It just doesn't it doesn't work. Nutrition. Obviously, nutrition backgrounding in at the feedlot is is critical for the for the ongoing. Achieve weight gains at all times. I'm, I'm, I'm 
very not an advocate anti anti um, commentator again. I understand it. I understand where it plays a role, but it doesn't. It doesn't give you the high performance. You get plenty of compensator gain from unwind cars because they go backwards for 30 days and then you pick it all up later. But in that meantime, wean calves, in our first 30 days, we average about 0.8 of a kilo a day. <coughs> in, that, in, that, in that backgrounding phase, or, or our booster phase as we call it, unweed calves, you, you might, you, you're lucky to maintain weight in 30 days. So, nutrition's important, which is starting at, at day one, which is from our point of view, it's from when we buy them, I guess, and, and accumulate them and then truck them. We're, we're looking at nutrition and water all the way through. By quality water, you can't end it. Underestimate anywhere. Whenever we're buying out of the wiener sales and wherever we're going to, the first thing I get the buyers to do is go and have a little water. In the, in the, so first thing is the um, carbs. Second thing is the water in the delivery pens. If the delivery pens have got dirty water, I instruct them not to buy from those yards. If the yards don't have soft floor on the floor, I say do not go into the yards, because there's no point in it, because we don't want crippled cattle. Um, and thirdly, if they're now, if they're not weaned, we don't want to buy them either, we don't give them. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware of that, we've seen enough literature in the papers about that, and that's fact, that's what we're doing. Um, so nutrition's important, obviously the feedlot, Nutrition is determined by the market specifications. Feedlot induction, I've, we've, I've briefly talked about. All, in, all our gun feed feedlots and all inductions are done prior to feedlot entry. So our cattle are delivered as pen lots. So in gun either 195 or 240. The transport is, is planned around feeding times and transport is planned to deliver pen lots together. Initially, the transport said, well, I want 100, 195 delivered, or can we use the same truck going backwards and forwards? No. Because that's three hours return trip. So cattle are gonna, half the cattle are gonna be standing around for three hours, waiting to go to their pen at the feedlot. There's, there's nothing to be done to them, going, they're going straight to the pen. So we aim for about a maximum of an hour on delivery to Gunny into the pen. Um, sometimes that changes a little bit, like there is such thing as breakdowns in transport, we accept that, that's reality. Uh, but at all times we're trying to get the transport around feeding times. They're feeding at, uh, what I start at 10.30, 10.30, 11. Yeah. So we're endeavouring them to get there at about nine o'clock in that, in that vicinity, and then they go basically Load it off the trucks, go through a scanner, and then straight to the pen. And that's how our cattle go to gun No, they don't go any through, anywhere near the working facilities. So the results, putting it, putting it together. Key outcomes, health, as, as Tony's covered very well. Um, obviously reducing deaths, increasing performance, increasing feed efficiency, and meeting market specs, which Market specs at the end of the day is what we're about. That's where you get paid. That's when the physical dollars come into your hand. So once you get the physical dollars in your hand there, then you can attribute all this back. But until you get the money in your hand, it doesn't get they become your <coughs> So this is some work that uh, Tony's been involved with. This is only October. This is uh, <coughs> Slides that were done up for the uh, feedlot of the year, I think it was up uh, on the Gold Coast. I just use these slides because what, what I'm just trying to show you is um, obviously this is going to be feedlot since we've taken it over. Benchmark position for VRD morbidity, while well, no cat gunner has, has low positions in both cattle types. That would be the same there, it would be lower about the same at the moment. Oh, it doesn't get the that, yeah, that's the ports and your, yeah. your cattle. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, it stands at the moment. Um, uh, it's probably running to the bottom. So we should be we should be here, and that's what 60% of the cattle. Yeah, 90% of the cattle. Yeah. 
So yeah, Gunnery will be in the last 20 to... Oh, sorry, no, sorry, the Gunnery, there's some of those yards below the likes of Namco. Yeah. Which we, that's a, that's a vertically integrated system of just one vendor. Yeah. And Brahman cattle, well, Correct. Cattle. And this is predominantly Ross Taurus cattle. Yeah, there's Brahmins in there. Yeah. <coughs> so they offended anyone by saying Ross Indigo is actually a healthier cattle in Playbox? It's just the fact. They are, but they're not as easy to feed. Correct. Their feet have problems. Correct. There's a. Not just with the weight. Yep. Correct. They're not there. Tremendous weight, aren't they? There you go. There's the T7. Yeah, that's the that's a short fed fellows. And the one below that, they won't mind us saying it is that. Yeah, this one here. Yeah. Okay. So what what we've done in Tony is how long have you been involved with Canada? Canada. Oh, since 2009. And obviously you saw the transition from when when we bought the cattle in. Yeah, yeah. Gunnery was sort of up in the mid, would have been mid, yeah. mid oh, field. Yeah, and then beyond us, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was all up in the bad bad end. We brought it right down to the, to the right end. What happened to the top line? Yeah, that's right. I, 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 don't, I honestly don't know which yard that was. But, uh, you don't have to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> You can see they broke really early too, and that yeah. October's that springtime, so uh, that, no, no, that's, a, that's a big outbreak. That, that, that would be a typical, say, uh, yeah. Yeah. probably something you know, actually. Yeah, lost, lost to us, probably. Mm -hmm. No, no, you picked it up. What have we got here? Uh, death loss. We're sitting on the bottom there, which is it's all relative to what we're saying. Like, Practice we've initiated at, at, in our integration, um, it, it flows through. It's not just we feel good about doing it at, at, on the farm level. It has a dollar value here and, a, and it's a, a value to the, what we're trying to do. Um, this is our uh, intake. Um, this is our uh, gun line. So we've got the highest, I think we are the highest intakes for that one. Yeah. Our cattle eat the most in Australia. It would be higher if you allowed it. Yeah, <laughs> we could go right up there. You could, yeah. yeah. It's, it's so our intake of our cattle the highest in, in, in the feedlots. Very simple, because we're conditioning, we're, we're conditioning that rumen from day one. We're looking after the rumen from day one, we're making sure it's expanded and it's ready to go. They've, they've been taught how to feed, or, or as most people say, they know how to eat. Some of them cattle know how to eat, and they do. And they go straight on the feed from day one. That's, that's the big difference. Um, not only do they eat, they convert as well, which is important, important part, because that's what they get paid for. There's a lot of cattle that eat and they convert very well, and they make as much money. Um, this is just a death loss thing, same sort of, same sort of thing. Uh, we've, we've seen a big decline in deaths, obviously, because of our, our treatments. And Again, I'd, I'd uh, make the comment that it's a bit like when we were speaking to Cameron yesterday.